Well, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you all for your interest in this session and for, for sticking with us uh, almost right to the bitter end. Uh, the future of U.S.-Canada trade relations tackles economic policy, the increasing role of national secure, security as a key policy driver, uh, relations with other strategic nations, and alignments and frankly, misalignments between Canada and the United States, keeping in mind the different electoral uh, results in both countries uh, over the next uh, several weeks and several months. As many of the Canadians in the audience know, uh, international trade is vitally important to our country's prosperity. I hazard to guess that in the United States, the average American has limited knowledge or understanding of the importance of cross-border trade between our two countries. In fact, Canada remains the largest trade partner of the United States when combining both imports and exports, with Mexico number two and China uh, a more distant number three. And um, I can almost predict with certainty that that is not well known uh, south of the border. In yesterday's speech by Ontario's finance minister, Peter Bethenfall, he told us that Ontario alone is the top trading partner with 30 states. Minister Ng today at lunch mentioned 36 states, and I, and I think that wasn't just Ontario, that was uh, other provinces. Uh, Peter went on to say if Ontario was a single country, it would have the third largest trading relationship in the world with the United States as a single entity. I'm guessing he, he might have meant fourth, but. Uh, so trade is indeed vital for both our nations. And a fun fact is that Canada has more free trade agreements with more countries than any other country on earth, which should position our country well in the coming decade. Both Robert and Carlos are public policy, trade and defense experts. We're delighted to have them on our stage today. Robert Asselin is Senior Vice President Policy at the Business Council of Canada and has had a long career in both the public and private sectors in Canada and abroad. From 2007 to 2015, uh, Robert was the Associate Director of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. In 2014, he was visiting professor, uh, sorry, visiting public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington. From 2017 to 2020, he was a senior global director of public policy at BlackBerry. In 2017, he was appointed senior fellow at the Monk School of Public Affairs and Public Policy here in Toronto at the University of Toronto and a fellow at the Public Policy Forum. From 2015 to 2017, he served as policy and budget director to Canada's finance minister. Mr. Asselin was a policy advisor to two prime ministers, Prime Minister Paul Martin and Justin Trudeau. Carlos diaz Rosillo, founding director of the Adam Smith Center for Economic Freedom, is an accomplished educator, administrator, pol pol political and policy entrepreneur, strategist, public communicator, and former senior government official in the United States. For four years, Carlos worked at the highest levels of the United States government, serving as deputy assistant to the president and director of policy and interagency coordination at the White House. He was senior deputy chairman and chief operating officer of the National Endowment for the Humanities and Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. He also served as a senior member of the 2016-2017 Presidential Transition. And before joining the government, Dr. diaz Rosillo was a member of the faculty of government at Harvard University where he taught popular courses on the American presidency and also served as assistant dean of Harvard College. 
His areas of expertise include presidential power, policy making, and policy implementation, and national security policy. Dr. Diaz Rosillo holds dual undergraduate degrees in civil engineering and international relations, summa cum laude, from Tufts University, two master's degrees in public policy and government from Harvard, and a PhD in government from Harvard. Welcome to you both, and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I'd like to start uh, with each of our guests giving some brief background comments on themselves, along with any opening remarks you wish to make. Robert, let's start with you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here with Carlos and Doug. Uh, so I'm both a student and a practitioner of public policy, political economy. I had the privilege to serve under three different prime ministers, uh, I should say liberal ones. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, being at the center of government teach you a lot of things that you don't know when you're not in government. And I, I see Minister Pettigrew here in the audience. Obviously, I had the privilege to work with him, uh, a great public servant, a, a phenomenal minister. Delighted to, to see you here. Um, one of the things that I've learned in government is when Mr. Trump was elected the first time in 2017, it was the largest curveball the government ever had inside the Canadian government, something, frankly, we did not expect. We were not prepared for. And it basically derailed the agenda of the government for uh, uh, at least a year for people to understand what happened, what were the cause of this, um, you know, the, the thinking behind this trade disruption and the, the rationale behind Mr. Trump uh, policy. And so, you know, we, we, we regroup, we organize. I give a lot of credit to the Prime Minister's team to uh, basically having saved uh, what is now called Kuzma, NAFTA. But it was really difficult, really challenging. Uh, and one of the lessons is still ongoing, obviously, and we'll see in a few weeks what happened. But whoever wins, we live in a very challenged environment on the trade side, what I call geopolitically challenge, and often, as I describe, as the return of political economy. And so it's not business as usual. The things that Canada took for granted, a trading partner down south that was reliable, always there to, uh, for us, it is obviously something we cannot take for granted anymore. Not that we're not good partners, but they have, uh, they have other objectives. Uh, and second, that uh, national security is at the center of this kind of rerouting of the trade disruption. And Canada is a trading nation. We need to trade. We're not a domestic market that is big enough to be dependent on our own domestic economy uh, despite, uh, you know, like the U.S. is. And so th this puts a, a, an additional challenge on us as Canadians to figure out this new world. And frankly, we're a bit behind. We're not proactive enough. We're not leveraging our strength, including on national security, which we'll talk more about. Thank you, Robert. Carlos. Great. So on the other side of the political aisle, um, I, I was a faculty member. I was a professor. And when uh, then candidate Trump uh, walked down the famous golden escalators and announced his candidacy for the presidency of the United States. I said, eh, that guy's going to be the next president. So I joined his, his team fairly early on. Uh, um, and, uh, before the election on the transition, and then I uh, was with him for, for the four years that he was in the white house, uh, working on first on the implementation of national security policy and also working at the intersection of policy and communications. I feel very strongly that you might have the best possible policies, whatever your policies are, but if you're not communicating them effectively and the people are not understanding what you're doing for them, then there's an issue. Um, and so I did not work directly on, on, on trade, but I did work indirectly on trade and of course on national security. So I'm delighted to hear uh, that that there will be an emphasis in, over the next 20 minutes or so on national security because I do feel that at the heart of, of our trading relationship, not just with Canada, but with any nation around the world, uh, national security has to be uh, the key piece. Um, yes, we need to trade. Economic policy incredibly important. But ultimately, our relationship with any country, 
however close that may be, as, as it is with Canada, national security has to be at the core. Um, and economic security is national security, and there cannot be economic security without trade, of course, but national security has to be at the center of anything any nation does with other nations around the world. So, so that's a great jumping off point uh, to my first question. And that is, uh, and maybe I can get you to expand on that, in what ways has national security become a driving force behind trade policy in both of our countries? And can you provide spe specific examples? I'm thinking, as, as a layperson, I'm thinking about energy, technology, natural resources, climate change and climate adaptation as, to me, some obvious ones, but maybe you could both expand on that. Carlos, why don't you sure. carry on? Sure. I, I think we've known that all along, but I think the pandemic really made it crystal clear uh, with the number of issues we've we had with, with uh, supply chains. And I think we're at a point in which we're realizing that all the issues you talked about uh, and, and many others, uh, if, if policymakers don't take into account the fact that national security is at the center of our trading relationship, uh, then then we're going to see it, that gap grow. Uh, we realize that we depend, we the United States depend heavily on China. Um, uh, our relationship with the Chinese for decades was, was a fairly bipartisan issue. Both Democrats and Republicans believed that the way to deal with China was to get closer to them, to trade with them, uh, uh, because the more we trade with the Chinese, the more the Chinese government would look like a Western democracy, the more democratic and the more capitalist China would become. And what we've realized is that, that that's not the case. That's far from it. And so there was a shift uh, uh, beginning with President Trump in a very aggressive way that, that the Chinese government is not our ally. They're our adversary. And, and if there's one issue now in which there's agreement in the United States, uh, a bipartisan agreement, both Democrats and Republicans, it is precisely that same issue on the other side. And so uh, one of the things that I think you'll see uh, going forward, regardless of who wins the election, especially if Trump, President Trump wins the election, is that the China will be at the center of American foreign policy. And therefore, our relationship with every other nation around the world, to a certain extent, is going to depend on that country's relationship with China. And so I think, I think that we're going to see a, a, a very clear realignment, and I think we're going to see uh, uh, trade relationships get strengthened or weakened, uh, uh, in part, in part, on on those countries' relationships with the Chinese. Thank so, you. so, two very consequential events: U.S.-China technological rivalry, which I think is reshaping fundamentally trade relations in the world, and obviously. As close ally, Canada uh, always stands with the U.S. on these big issues. I, I should say on trade, though, I think we have to distinguish the technology part of trading, where it's much more sensitive for obvious reasons, and more like commodities and goods and services exports, where it's less problematic. And when you look at trade flows, it's still very impressive, including U.S. and China on these things. The second very consequential event, obviously, is on national security, is the, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. And I think for a country like Canada, that as, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, neglected defense spending, national security, it's a huge wake-up call. And so it, it will force us, whoever is prime minister, to re-engage and be a better ally uh, a better partner on the world stage and reinvest in defense because uh, that has huge implications on trade with the U.S. I think we want to be seen by our U.S. partner, again, Democrats and Republicans, as reliable partners when it comes to defense, national security. And so uh, that puts the onus on us. And certainly the business community is strongly, strongly in favor of meeting the 2% target uh, of GDP on NATO. And, and I know we're not talking too much about NATO, but I think if President Trump is, re -elected, is, is elected for a second term, I think that 2% mark will be critical. I think he understands very well that this alliance is far more than just a number, 
Uh, uh, but for him, that number is important because it was a commitment made by every uh, uh, ally. And the fact that there are nations that are not meeting that 2% will be critical in how we approach the strength of that relationship. As an aside, uh, this later this week, I'm hosting a small dinner party with the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO here in town. And uh, I know for a fact that this is that Canada's um, lack of a robust plan to get to 2% uh, is likely going to be part of the conversation around the dinner table. Um, getting back to trade, how have recent economic policies in both the U.S. and Canada shaped current trade relationships between our two countries? Maybe I can start. Um, so protectionism now is a fact of life, but I think we need to understand why. What did, where did it come from, this economic populism that is emerging, not just in the U.S., but everywhere? It came from the fact that um, in many Western economies, a lot of people felt, um, didn't feel they had the full, the full benefits of globalization. You know, as an economist, you look at the number and free trade obviously is good. You see trade flows, you see GDP growth. You're like, this is what we need to do. And it's kind of a self-evident. But when you look at the, the discontent, the, 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 the economic populism that is emerging from many parts of each of our countries, I think, that has led to political leaders having a much different take on globalization. Is it a good thing, a good development? I personally don't think so. Is it something I understand politically? Yes, I do, because people need to react to how people feel. But I am worried that this protectionist, this protectionism mantra going further and further as we go, I think we're just at the beginning of it, will be very damaging, especially for a country like Canada that is a trading nation that relies on a world trading ar architecture that works. And what we're seeing is WTO doesn't work. US uh, is gonna go hard after China for the reasons that we mentioned, especially on technology. And so for Canada, we're, we're a junior partner and we have to think about what we have as leverage. And I would think uh, in the world of economic security, energy security is something that Canada can provide in a very significant way. And what I'm seeing, unfortunately, from this government is shying away from uh, this leverage that we have. And when I mention energy, it's the whole mix of energy, renewable, existing energy, stuff like geothermal that I think has a lot of potential. And I will mention nuclear that I think Canada could be a real powerhouse. We have uranium, one of the best uranium reserves in, in, uh, in the world in Saskatchewan. We have the technology. We can lead on small modular reactors. This is something we must take advantage of. So I, I agree with everything you've said 100%, except with the conclusion. I do think it's a good thing. And let me tell you why. Uh, uh, as you said, rightfully so, uh, you need to understand the frustration that, that the average worker, in the case of the US, whether it's in Michigan or in Ohio, uh, the real frustration uh, that the average worker has when they feel that the system has you know, left them behind. Um, from an economic perspective, right, yes, free trade is absolutely good. Everybody's better off when you free trade. Um, if, if, if you were to teach a class on, 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 on the economic theory behind free trade, there's no question that, that tariffs don't make sense from an economic perspective. They do make sense from a political perspective, of course, and, and they're one tool out of many tools. We have economic tools, we have political tools. And so understanding that frustration from the average worker that feels that the system left them behind, that their jobs were transferred somewhere else, that, uh, that other countries are not playing on a level uh, field, that, that the system is not fair for them, is key to understand why you have governments, politicians, who, who use uh, or threaten to use tariffs as a tool that then becomes a very effective way to get other leaders to come to the negotiating table. If you have a leader that says, I'm gonna slap a 20% tariff on you, but nobody believes that you'll do it, then it's not gonna work. Right. But if you have somebody who has a reputation for being unpredictable and, and somebody that you believe 
as is the case with President Trump, that he will slap the 20% tariff or the 50% tariff or the 100% tariff, then you go to the negotiating table and you come up with something that is good not only for one side, but for both sides. And so, and so I do think that even if economically there is, there's very clear evidence that tariffs are not good for the economy, they're not good for consumers, I think in the long term, they could be a very useful political tool to achieve the outcome, which is a better uh, 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 trade agreement for everyone, not just for one side or the other one. Um, on top of that, I'd, what I think uh, uh, is, is, is something that's very clear in the case of the US, in the case of President Trump, is, is a preference for bilateral trade agreements as opposed to multilateral trade agreements because of the belief that you can monitor how each side is doing more effectively when you have a bilateral agreement as opposed to a multilateral trade agreement with three, four, five, seven nations where one could take advantage of the other one. So, so again, from an economic perspective, 100% get it. But from a political perspective, unless you understand the root causes and unless you understand that, that governments are designed to advance the interests of their people, uh, then it, it makes a little bit more sense. Uh, one thing maybe I could add, Carlos, to what you just said. Uh, first, I'm glad you recognize tariffs are bad for consumers. Economically, in the yeah, short term, yeah. yes. It, it, in, in the short term, there, there's no question. The question is in the long term. Yes. Are consumers going to be better off when right. you renegotiate and you get to an equilibrium that is better? But short terms, yeah, if you slap a tariff, prices go up. Yes. And, and the, the, the second point I wanted to make on this is I understand the, you know, the, the, prepos the predisposition to impose tariffs when you have trade deficits, but I do think the Canada-U.S. relation is really different in a sense that it's beneficial to both sides. Um, I don't think you have border problems with us. Uh, we're very aligned nations. And so in, in my perspective, the way to think about this is an economic block that would include Canada, that would make uh, your industrial base even stronger. We think about Odo, where we're already well integrated, but I'm thinking on energy security, you know, uh, you do need uh, heavy oil from Canada. Mm -hmm uh critical minerals you know obviously we have we have some of those and so I, I see a lot of good partnerships and i'm hoping that um whoever is in the white house will think that way going forward and a shameless plug energy you mentioned energy uh, at the center that i run uh, the adam smith center for economic freedom we have a monthly magazine called agenda that uh, uh, publishes uh four articles from policymakers from uh, uh, uh the united states four uh, from the rest of the Americas and four from Europe. And in the previous one, I wrote an article about energy and how Mexico, the US and Canada together could really uh, do a lot better in terms of providing energy security, not just for the three countries of North America, but for the hemisphere. Right. Um, it, we've only got a few minutes left. This, this countdown clock is uh, <laughs> relentless. Uh, in what ways do public perceptions of trade and national security influence political discourse and as a result of that policy making in our two countries? Carlos? Sure. I'd, so I, th I, I, I think the average citizen in any country, right, is not, doesn't really uh, follow what's happening in the trade world. Uh, what they understand, what I said before, they understand how it affects their pockets, right? They understand that that uh, uh, if jobs go south, as as they as they go in the case of the U.S., that it doesn't matter if the if the if the political economy behind the trade agreement is flawless, they care about what affects their pocketbooks, and so th that translates into into angry voters, and angry voters tend to vote more than happy voters, and so that discourse affects what happens at the ballot box because people feel that, that those beautiful economic policies, no matter how well you explain them, and no matter how much it, how much it makes sense in, 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 in the textbook, it affects them directly. And so policy is a reflection of a number of issues. Uh, one of those issues is voters, as it should be. So the, fundament, the, fandom, the fundamental trade-off here, essentially, is between efficiency and production. And um, a lot of politicians, to keep workers happy, kind of are moving on the production side. We just need to realize it's going to be more costly to produce things here 
uh, because there's a reason why it was more efficient sometimes to go elsewhere to produce things. And so this trade-off is still being worked out, uh, but I think there's a, there are limitations to how much things a, a country a small like Canada can produce. I'm for an advanced industry agenda, an innovation agenda where we are uh, deliberate in industry like industries like aerospace, advanced manufacturing, bio manufacturing. Those are the industries of the future, and we need to compete in those. Otherwise, we're not going to increase our productivity. But I am uh, certainly worried uh, for those who think and argue that everything should be pro produced at a local level. It just goes against the logics of, e of economics. But, but, uh, but, but a similar thing, for example, subsidies, right? Again, from an economic perspective, right? Subsidies don't really make sense. Why should government be picking winners and losers? But the only reason why we have a company as strong as, as Airbus, right, in, in Europe is because of government subsidies. So there are times in which government make decisions that from an economic perspective might seem it's not the right one. In the long term, it actually works out. Um, I know we're at the end of our time. Uh, however, if you would just permit, permit me to do one lightning round question, and that's about November 5th. Uh, <laughs> can, I, can I get both of your perspectives on who comes out on top? Carlos, I'm guessing I know your your answer, but Trump. Um, uh, so, so I gave a talk two weeks ago to a group of business leaders from Spain, and and when I talked about the electoral college, for a lot of people, uh, it's very difficult to understand why the U.S. has a system like it has, with where where the where, where the president is elected by 538 individuals, not by the 180 million Americans who are going to go vote. And, and I was explaining the swing states, and there are seven swing states this side. And I said, based on, on the average of polls, as of right now, the vice president has a lead in three of the swing states. The former president has a lead in, the other, in three of the other ones, and one is tied. I gave the same talk this Monday to a group of American business leaders, and I said, same thing, except that he has a lead in six of the seven swing states, and the seventh, she has a small lead. Today, the president has a lead in all seven uh, swing states, if you look at the aggregate of polls. Um, and so it, if the election were right now, and it's not right now, there's two and a half weeks, and one week is an eternity in politics. So two and a half weeks is two and a half eternities. So, so it, there's a long way to go. But as of now, I think the president, uh, former President Trump wins, and he wins uh, every one of the swing states as of now. Wow. Robert? I'm afraid I'll stay diplomatic on this one. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you both, gentlemen. Uh, we, I've got a whole raft of additional questions, and we clearly could have gone on much longer. But please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you.